Uh, thank you guys so much, and thank you, uh, everybody from Pro Bono Net. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. We have a very exciting set of presenters that I'm going to moderate. And so, hold on, let me just... We have Tally Wells, who works at Atlanta Legal Aid Society and has been the force behind the Olmstead project that we've been working um, with for a little while. And so he's going to be um, sharing um, information about how he has been doing advocacy, training, and capacity building in the context of uh, getting that support court decision out. And then we have Kathy Daniels, who is at Legal Services of Connecticut and who has been a longstanding member of the legal aid tech community and of the legal aid community um, working in technology projects. So I'm very excited to have them share their projects. And before we get started, I just wanted to give a little bit of context of why we're doing this topic. And basically, um, you know, there's a lot of push factors that are pushing us as a community to go and innovate and bring technology in as a way to leverage ourselves um, and leverage the work that we do. So in thinking about uh, training lawyers, training pro bono advocates, and then training ourselves and then how we do self-advocacy, um, what are the push factors? So these were the things that I was thinking about when I was thinking, like, what would we want to showcase? And so one of the things that I think a lot of us went through is in the early, late, late 2000s, we were really thinking um, about the digital natives, and we had a bunch of sessions and presentations about that. And, um, you know, the digital native conversation continues to be relevant. We haven't talked about it in a little bit, but it's continuing to be relevant because it's not only impacting the staff that we bring into our programs or that go into working to self-help or, you know, assistance, but it also digital natives are now our clients. Anyone that's 18 or over that has the, you know, legal standing is a digital native. So when we look at all the resources shrinking and technology getting commoditized, and everybody having a better understanding of the benefit of technology in their personal life, we look at all of these push factors, we can see that there's a great impetus for technology. So I start thinking, okay, so what are the things that now have kind of become ubiquitous? And for example, you know, people are doing trainings in Google Handouts. Podcasts are kind of very normal now. They, they used to be really new and cool, but now everybody, a lot of programs are doing them at the national level, at the local level, by substituting area. The social media, media icons, you're kind of, it's kind of like if, you, if your page doesn't have it, it's, it's, it's wow, why don't they have social media? Um, Skype is being used a lot to communicate um, and to do um, non-advice type work with clients. Crowdfunding, e-conferences, all of that, a lot of groups are working on that and experimenting on that. So all of these are just examples of what providers are doing to adopt technology. You know, there's texting projects going on, courts texting people for court appointments, legal aid texting people for appointment reminders. Um, and now what's exciting is that there's also more integration happening where you're taking proven tools and integrating them into multiple platforms. And, you know, we have new funders also coming online. For example, the Knight Foundation funded a project in Illinois called Expungement I.O., and that project um, uses Law Help Interactive to generate forms. So that's an example of an integration, but um, there's a lot of excitement going on in the legal aid community around technology. The other piece is the client piece, you know, and some of the things that we're dealing with, which are very real, is the DYI movement. It's a complete change in how consumers want to use and control their time and what they do. This is not a trend that is going to get reversed, and it's really reshaping our economic and our um, democracy. So the DYI movement is here to stay. Our clients want to do things on their own, and that's what they expect in their private life and what they're going to expect when they're getting legal services. On demand, you know, 24-7, the growth of suburban poverty is a huge factor, and it really impacts um, low-income communities that are not in the city. 
Um, when you look at transportation and mobility barriers for suburban communities to come all the way to center city for services, then technology really starts making a lot of sense. So all of these are kind of things that are changing in client communities, commute times, lack of buses, poor infrastructure, those kind of things. And then the demographics, the bottom line is that we have a growing group of um, baby boomers that are going to be aging, a significant majority of them who used computers when they were 40. So they have been using computers for 25 years um, or longer. Some of them may have worked. Um, being some of the early adapters with the Commodore 64, if you remember that. So all of these are things that are changing in our client community, and they will expect and demand that we serve them online. So with this context, why did we pick the two projects that we're going to share? And basically, I think that they demonstrate how technology, multiple layers of technology can be ent integrated in a very specific um, client-centric way, these projects are looking at a particular goal and then figuring out how they're going to integrate multiple tools to get that result. So that's one reason why we picked these two projects. The other thing is that they're projects that are really great, but maybe a lot of you have not had exposure to them. And there are a lot of other good projects that we are not going to have time to highlight that we, we're not showcasing. We may allude to them. But we wanted to bring the light, shine the light on these two projects and these two groups, and hopefully to get people to see and get inspired by this and see if they want to tackle this as part of advocate training or as part of self-advocacy with your client community groups. And very important, they're collaborative in nature. You will see that they're working with a lot of other groups outside of legal aid. And in our perspective, at least in mine, I know that we believe in collaboration. That is a super important. Without collaboration, you create only a project that has one view of the world, and that sometimes doesn't work when you're working with such a diverse community as we have here in the United States. So without more, I am going to let um, Kathy Daniels take us through her online classroom project in Connecticut. And Kathy, I, I will screen and um, move the screen, so tell me when I need to move down. I will. Um, as you can all see, uh, as Claudia said, this is a collaborative project. It was started by Statewide Legal Services. We actually began this in about 2012, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, but at this point, it includes Cali, which is um, a wonderful addition. They're, they're involved in a lot of our work. Um, ctlawhelp.org is our statewide website. And uh, we're very pleased to be um, working on this project through LSC's TIG program. So that's our original group of, that's our current group of collaborators. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this is going to show you what one of our online classes for um, self-represented parties or clients looks like. Um, back in 2012, we were sort of grappling with the issue of wanting to figure out a way to help clients deal with lengthy or complex or both problems. And we decided that a classroom with more or less like a checklist on the side would walk them through some walk them through the steps of the process so that they could tackle it in pieces. Um, an awful lot of things happen um, likely months months apart. They might have to take one action now and based on that action do something else in two weeks. But it, it gets complicated, and a lot of people have trouble following it. So we tried to break it down. Um, if they log into the site, um, they can, as you can see in the lower left, they could they can take notes or create a reminder for themselves. So they can sort of create their own little to-do list as they go through the class. And there's a calculator and instructions up towards the right-hand side. Um, so what we did is. In the beginning, we built seven classes for um, self-represented parties on topics that were basically federal so that other states can use them. 
and um, excuse me, uh, we posted them on ctlawhelp.org, translated most of them into Spanish, and um, put the word out in the community, and they've been very well received. We built a template, uh, we call it a template, um, so that other states could replicate our project um, and not have to you know, reinvent the wheel, as they say. Um, we built it in Drupal, because our website is Drupal. We worked with um, Scott Friday, who did some wonderful work for us. And um, so this is what the classroom looks like. The following year, which is the next slide, we um, added on some trainings for pro bono attorneys because that it is also another audience that we found would be um, would would be able to use this type of activity to learn something new. The pro bono attorneys may not have handled an eviction or um, different types of cases. And this would give them an opportunity to go through the training um, and do what we ordinarily used to do in sort of a group setting. And we'd get a bunch of attorneys together. We'd get a couple of pro bono lawyers together. Um, a lot of work would go into building a training, and everybody would sort of you know, sit there and go through it, um, video record it. Um, print up some materials, and um, it was hard. It was essentially, you know, a locked-in time and locked-in materials. If something was going to change, um, we'd have to redo the materials, um, and we'd have to keep redoing the same class. So building an online class made a whole lot of sense. Because they're modular, as you can see on the left, they're a little steps again, <clears throat> excuse me, um, each section, for example, if a piece of law changes, you can just change that section. So your um, on the <clears throat> online classroom stays current. Um, excuse me. OK, so what we've done now is we realized that um, there was quite a bit of interest out there in building classrooms, but unfortunately, it was built. Our our classroom template that we were happy to share was built in Drupal, and if you didn't have a Drupal site, you would either have to build one out or add it onto your own site. So for this current TIG, what we did was we teamed up with Callie, who has extensive experience with Drupal and working with community groups to build a national site where any program that would like to go to it can go and build their own, <clears throat> their own classrooms. And they don't have to maintain Drupal um, to do it. Excuse me. <laughs> um, they don't have to maintain Drupal. Callie is going to maintain the site and keep hosting it going forward. The way it works is pretty exciting. Um, people go build a site, and they will be able to share content with other programs that are building out classrooms on the same site. So it's essentially all in one place. Each um, program that goes there would have their own space, and they can sort of borrow content that's generic from another site. Um, let's see. So there, were, there was a quick question here, which was, um, what is Drupal? And to just really quickly answer that, it's a content management system that a lot of websites are built on. It's a but like um, WordPress. Um, so at any rate, people can share content on the site. What we've done is we've actually built some classrooms that we're going to put up there to use as examples. And um, we're actually starting some testing going on this week to show 
um, to work with people from other states and um, other platforms to have them come in and take a look and um, build out their own classrooms and see how it works. We're planning to open this all up to the community at probably around the end of September. Um, the classes, some of the features of classes that are going to be good for legal aid, um, in addition to everybody having their own space, you're going you're gonna to have your own login. Um, think of like Law Help Interactive where you can go and you can log in as your as yourself and sort of store your stuff and find your find your own stuff and set set a certain amount of security. You're going to be able to upload your own logo so that um, you can put an identity on your classes. Um, you're going to have a standardized format, which is really nice for the classes. Um, all the classes are on demand uh, for the users, so this really ties in with what. Claudia was talking about. People are on the go at this point. They want to be able to get it on their cell phone. They want to be able to get it at a time that's convenient for them and a place that's convenient for them and on a device that's convenient for them. Um, people, they're free, so that people can come and go and take them as frequently as they would like. We found that with some of the um, pro bono classes that we had built out, um, you know, the pro bono lawyers went back through them several times. And so we thought that was really nice. And we got good feedback on it. Um, this is um, a list of some of the classes, some of the samples in the classroom. This is what the content creator's interface looks like. I think, Claudia, if you go back, back a, a slide, this is, um, one of the really big features of the classes, we, you can put in all sorts of types of content. This shows um, a YouTube video. You can embed um, guided interviews. You can put fillable forms. You can put graphics. You can spreadsheets. Um, and again, your own logo. Whatever you put in there is really, you know, whatever suits your class. Um, Let's see, so the next one, the next slide, that's a sample of some of the um, classes that we've already put up for, that are going to be available for our testers to start working with. Um, and they're on the Learn the Law site. Um, something that I really like about it is um, new users are going to be able to come to the site and actually clone something that someone else has done. So for example, another state could come in and clone our restraining order class that we have put up there. Now obviously- so I've, I've, got a quick, I've got a quick question. Um, some of the viewers here headed over to learnthelaw.org and they seem not to be accepting new subscriptions. Um, it, it appears that it's available to law students. How do members of the legal aid community get access to this at this point? Um, at this point, they don't. Um, we're still we're still working on the um, multi-site functionality and the login to it. Um, what they're bumping into when they go to learnthelaw.org is an old Cali site, or that they had built um, and then sort of abandoned, and we picked up. Um, so they cannot yet get to this. Okay, but the plans are eventually to be able to. Oh yes, plans are definitely, people are gonna be able to get to it very shortly. Um, okay, when, yeah. when that happens, we will be happy to post it on um, our blog and share it on the LS Tech list um, so that people know how to get access. Okay, yeah, if people wanna look at the, um, look at what the class like, classrooms look like, uh, it, they could go to ctlawhelp.org and um, from the home page just scroll down sort of a little bit into the middle and they will find under the resource section the online classes. And um, I can also let them know about the link to the, um, to the pro bono afterwards. Um, back to, back to um, well, we had one more question here, which is, um, 
How are you uh, vetting the content and contributions? Um, we are going. We are going to um, give people a certain amount of latitude. There are going to be terms of service. Um, we're working with the ones that Callie has um, previously used, and um, also looking at the ones from Law Help Interactive to make sure um, that there are not any issues with content. Um, we're also going to watch it. Um, Apparently, okay. yeah. Um, but we're not we're not trying to reinvent that wheel. We're we're working with people who have already, you know, been down that path, and we're going to rely on their experience and make sure that it works for us. Um, Excellent. Back to the back to the classroom. Um, so, if somebody wanted to duplicate a classroom that Connecticut had done, for example, for a restraining order, they could literally. Um, duplicate the steps that are in our restraining order class, um, make a class for their own state or program, and all they would have to do is um, update the content so that it reflects um, the laws and the timelines and the documents that um, are relevant for their state in theory. Um, it can be that simple. Um, so if you don't come to the table with um, a lot of experience writing scripts, which definitely is a talent, um, I, can, I can vouch for that. Um, if you don't come to the table with that talent, you can draw on other people's and sort of get your feet wet by duplicating and updating something and you know, uploading your own graphics, um, you know, a picture of your own courthouse, a picture of your own forms. Um, and sort of build out something, and before you know it, you've got a classroom of your own. Um, there's also a fair amount of generic content that we're going to try and put up there, things like a video on going to court and you know telling you what to wear, that type of, that type of video that we've all seen and a lot of us have. But we've, we're going to put it up there, and so if somebody else wants to use it, all they have to do is go and pick it up and drop it into their classroom. Uh, they don't have to invent anything. They don't have to go record anything, and it's right there on the same site. They don't even have to sort of search it out. Um, let's see. Yeah, as I said, um, we're going to open it up for general use. Um, pro it looks like toward the end of September, once the testing is done, we're working out a couple of last little bit little bugs with um, having multiple sites or multiple programs using the same site and sharing the same content. Um, it's, there's some fairly sophisticated stuff going on um, underneath to make that work. Um, so when you're thinking about classes, um, we, we've used them so far for um, self-represented parties or clients and also for pro bono attorneys. We're really heading now toward um, using them more broadly. Um, we took our pro bono classes and um, made them available to um, interns who were coming in. So the interns were able to take a class, uh, again, on handling an eviction, on uncontested divorce, custody, security deposits, those types of things, and learn what they would ordinarily have learned in you know, a class with our staff. So again, it's that same model. You can also use them for board training, for staff training. Um, so we, we're starting to see that uh, these could really expand resources available. Um, and they do you know, as Claudia said, respond to the way people like to work at this point. Um, and the last slide um, tell, gives you our contact information. And we would be very happy to talk to anybody who is interested in more information. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, 
Definitely uh, keep an eye on the LS tech list and on the blog um, LS and LSNTAP um, site so that when this opens up for the whole community, um, people can go and check it out. I just wanted to point out that since Connecticut went live with their classroom on the self-represented side, the assembly rate of the online forms, the LHI online forms, has increased. So this is a really good way to integrate other projects that you have going and get even additional return on investment on that other work, like a form, et cetera. So thank you for sharing um, with us. We're going to switch gears, and we're going to go to new ways of doing self-advocacy. And um, Tally Wells, who has been the visionary behind this project, uh, will, be our, we, will be our presenter. And Tally, just let me know when you want me to slide down. Great, thank you. Well, I'm excited um, to talk about this. I'm also, I saw some, some good questions for Kathy, so stay tuned because I, I think she's got some other good questions to answer because um, they were questions I had as well. Um, I, so OlmsteadRights.org is our website uh, that specifically um, is focused on the United States Supreme Court decision, um, Olmstead VLC, which was a legal services decision. It was done by the Atlanta Legal Aid Society where I work. Unfortunately, it was before my time. But Olmstead is the most important decision for people with disabilities um, in our country's history. It is often called the Brown v. Board of Education decision because it essentially says that anyone who's in a nursing home or other institution in your state has the right, in most instances, to receive the supports and services in the community, in their own homes, rather than having to be segregated with all people with disabilities in an institution. Unfortunately, not enough people know about Olmstead. So one of, um, we had three main goals with our website, and two of them are, are what I want to discuss today um, around um, self-advocacy. But one of them was that people just didn't know about this decision. They didn't know about the right to live in um, the, the community and certainly not how to access it. And so um, we created um, an I Am Olmstead campaign, which I'm going to talk about in a second, to actually get the word out to folks. And we have um, a lot of content um, that's based on this idea of all the different people who have been impacted on Olmstead, getting their stories out so um, that people could actually know what Olmstead is and then how to access their rights. And then the second part of this um, is uh, self-help tools. Uh, the third part is the legal advocacy tools, which I'm not going to talk about today, but is 50% um, of the website, which is actually um, equipping lawyers to do um, Olmstead-type cases. Because just because the U.S. Supreme Court issued a decision does not mean that the country has changed based on Olmstead. There is a lot of work that needs to happen and a lot of work that is happening. There's litigation in all 50 states. Um, so we have um, tools and outlines and all of, pretty much all of the pleadings from across the country that have been filed um, on the website and um, a lot of links and, and things for lawyers and the members who have joined our group. Um, and then we have the self-help tools. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, we have, and this is a growing, um, our website is, is um, not as advanced as Kathy's because we're um, still uh, just finishing up um, our year and a half mark of the website, but we have um, a fairly robust amount of self-help tools. Um, first, just explaining what self-advocacy is and why we use the term self-advocacy, and that'll be the next slide, um, but not yet. Um, we have self-advocacy materials, we have um, podcasts, we have uh, links and resources. But first, I, I wanted to explain what, why we're using the term self-advocacy and what it means on this website, which is not the, at the full meaning as um, in other places. But self-advocacy is a critical term in lots of places, but it is particularly important in the disability community. The disability community has a phrase that is um, throughout the disability community that is nothing about us without us. The, um, for most of our country's history, people with disabilities were told where to live. They were told how they were going to live. Um, they had very little control of their lives, and it was, it's critical to the disability community that this change and that they have the ability to um, be a part of every decision 
that's made about um, how they live their lives. And so self-advocacy is a critical part of this, um, advocating for oneself. And um, I do have um, a disclaimer on the next slide. Um, when we t so if you go to the next slide, when we talk about um, self-advocacy, what we are not talking about on our website, and what, if you use the term self-advocacy and you're a LSE um, organization, um, you're not talking about on your website is lobbying and um, changing public policy except through litigation. Um, and so it's important to remember to look at these rules. However, as we all know um, who are part of the TIG community, um, that um, James Sandman and um, LSC has made a huge uh, push for us to ensure that we get self-help tools out to the larger community and that individuals be able to represent themselves and be able to advocate for themselves. And so for this website, um, the, the term is, is more limited to the self-advocacy that you can do um, sort of within the LSC um, requirements. We'll go to the next page. So um, I talked about I Am Olmstead. That for us is a huge part of self-advocacy is getting the stories out about um, people whose lives have been transformed through Olmstead. And the Olmstead story is best told by the two individuals who were the plaintiffs in the Olmstead case. On the right is Lois Curtis, who, um, and on the left is Elaine Wilson. Uh, Lois um, it has become a pretty famous artist. She had her art um, put up at the White House, got to meet President Obama. She's never returned to an institution, but she had been for most of her life up until 2000, uh, I'm sorry, 1995, had been in institutions and basically sort of sheltered. And um, same with Elaine Wilson, she went into an institution at I think age 13 and was basically in an institution until her 40s when she got out through the Olmstead case. And um, both of them have become huge self-advocates. They go around, and um, Elaine has passed away now, but she would go around, she actually created a PowerPoint presentation, would go around and share her story. Um, Lois um, mostly shares her story through her art and um, has have really spread the word of Olmstead. Um, but what we did on our website was take all, not just Lois and Lane, but lots and lots of different individuals who have been impacted by Olmstead and let them share their stories. And this has also been a huge empowering um, piece, both through our website and in other forms. There's something we have here in Georgia called the Respect Institute. It's in other states as well where people with um, lived experience of mental illness go around and share their stories. They often at um, our state agency for behavioral health, they open every board meeting with a, a recovery story at um, many of the conferences and presentations. We have people share the recovery stories because so many people have been trained in, in how to tell their stories and because of how, um, how much it helps their, their recovery journey to be able to share their stories. This story is one of my favorites. This is on our website. This is. Um, a YouTube video of Willie, who had been in an institution from 2003 to 2010. He was in a nursing home here in Atlanta. And you, as you can see from these phrases, um, these are just pieces of what Willie shares in his video. And the technology is simple. It's video, YouTube, and then the amazing closed captioning that you can do on YouTube that is so simple to do. Um, and um, Willie shares his story. And he has opened up the eyes of so many people about the individuals who are in nursing homes who could be living much more full lives in the community. And Willie, um, since 2010, has been doing fabulous. Um, he's about 85 years old. And um, he uh, says he likes to get in his, wheel, his electric chair, make sure it's charged up, and get on the subway and ride from one end to the other just so he can um, show that he's living his life and, and get out in the community. And he um, is pretty much everybody knows Willie. But for Seven years, he was locked away in a nursing home. And it has been incredibly empowering for Willie to share his story. He shared it at the Carter Center last year as we had a big Olmstead event. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide. We also, um, this was a huge help to our website, but it was also very empowering for the self-advocates, was we had a big photo shoot. And we um, basically have all of our pictures throughout our website 
are individuals who have um, disabilities and who are self-advocates and many of them whom were either in a nursing home or avoided going to a nursing home through um, Medicaid waivers, which is one of the main ways um, people can get uh, Medicaid-funded services in the community. It's sort of the key tool for Olmstead. And they're able to share their stories and spread the word. If you'll go to the next slide. Um, and then one of the basic tools, I mean, these are simple tools. I am not a techie. These are not advanced tools, but they're so helpful to spread the word is, is sharing the history of Olmstead and the Americans with Disabilities Act. We celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act last month. And um, a year ago, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of Olmstead Facebook and Twitter and blogging and the web have been a huge way to spread the word and then bring people to our website. Um, so for the 16th anniversary of Olmstead and also back in the 15th anniversary of Olmstead, we had a bunch of events. We were um, tweet tweeting and sending out Facebook posts and drawing people back into our website and showing off different parts of our website. Um, but the biggest part was um, the history because these were historical moments to share. And we were getting um, hundreds of likes and shares. Uh, I think our, our biggest one was like 300 shares on Facebook um, that were drawing people back to the website. So these were huge sort of ways to get people to come to the website and then they could access the self-help tools. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, we have um, basically broken up every state and provided all of the different ways in which if you're a person with a disability and you need supports and services to avoid going into a nursing home or if you're in a nursing home or if you're in an institution you want to return to the community, every state has various resources. And so what we've done is is broken up the 50 states and provided um, the tools for each of your states for all of the different organizations that can assist either in advocacy or in an individual on their own going and um, seeking these benefits and services. And we have guides, um, which I'll mention later in, the web, in this, um, to help people in how to do this. One of the things we've learned and we've got to fix through our analytics and um, our AdWords is that putting all 50 states on one web page was a no-no. So we are in the process of splitting up all of our 50 states into 50 pages um, because that's uh, going to be much better using our Google AdWords um, free uh, account to um, draw people in if we're doing it state by state as opposed to um, bringing them to a page that has all 50 states. Um, so, and we used a, just a, a simple CSS table to create the 50 states, which we're going to break apart. Next slide. Um, our biggest tool on the website is um, we had developed an A to J, but we were caught right in the middle of A to J4 and A to J5. And we are in A to J middle. And we needed to go ahead and launch our website. So instead, we used Hot Docs and the LHI format. Many of you know Kristen Verrill. I thank God every day for Kristen Verrill. She created this um, after we had done the template all the way complete in A to J4 and figured out we couldn't launch it. Um, we redid it in um, Hot Docs. And, and we found um, for our purposes and ensuring that the site is fully accessible that the Hot Docs and the LHI has been a, a very helpful way to do this. Um, and what we've created is a questionnaire where if you're in a nursing home, you can figure out how to um, find uh, who can advocate for you, your legal services organization or protection and advocacy organization. You can also, um, we have a tool, if, I think it's on um, two slides from now, um, that um, will essentially fill out a complaint that you can file with the United States Justice Department or the Office for Civil Rights and Health and Human Services, and we go through a whole questionnaire. People can fill it out, file a complaint, and um, both HHS and the Department of Justice have been incredibly active in pushing Olmstead forward. So that's um, one way a person can file a complaint without a lawyer, but we also first try to draw them into going to the legal services attorneys and the protection and advocacy organizations that can do it as well. Um, we also explain throughout this, um, through different um, documents, what um, the different tools are that people can access. 
uh, in terms of Medicaid waivers, a program called Money Follows the Person, and we provide guides for all of that um, through this platform, but then also in our self-help materials. Next slide. So the questionnaire will lead to just the resources and um, uh, uh, links to get to your specific state um, legal services organization or um, protection advocacy organization. Next slide. Um, and these are the complaints, um, and basically each of these lines get filled in through the hot docs. And next slide. And um, then we have various guides um, for how to do self-advocacy um, on your own, what terms are used, how to apply for the various programs, what the various programs are that can enable individuals to live in the community and not in institutions. Next slide. And um, we have a lot of um, various, we have a whole section called self-help materials where we have um, worked with the National Disability Rights Network, um, which is the umbrella organization for all of the protection advocacy organizations across the country, to gather um, information. Um, there, one of the big things right now is that there is a federal regulation that is requiring every state to um, comply with, in order to comply with Olmstead, to change their um, how they have all their settings. And there's a lot of different. Um, meetings going on in every state around this, and we've got a lot of Q&As around how you can participate in those. Um, we've got state Olmstead plans. Um, the United States Supreme Court essentially said states should create an Olmstead plan, a plan for how they're going to comply with the Olmstead decision, and we've got uh, the various state Olmstead plans on our website. Next slide. And um, we also have podcasts. This is still in its um, infancy. Um, we are, um, right now our podcasts are on YouTube, but we are um, working um, with a, a host sharing um, app and that um, we'll be sharing our podcasts much more broadly. And that is, um, we're in our sort of last uh, six months of our TIG grant, and the podcasts are something we're really going to be um, focusing on for the, for the end of our grant. We will be continuing to make our um, self-help tools uh, much more robust and getting the word out th uh, through AdWords, through Facebook and Twitter, and bringing people in. And um, we've been especially gratified to get a lot of feedback and a lot of suggestions and a lot of materials from individuals through getting the word out. So that's what we're doing on OlmsteadWrites.org, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And that's my website, my email address. Thank you, thank you both. Um, I we had I created some resources that may be interesting uh, for people, and those are available in the PowerPoint, and all of that will be download, downloadable for LSN tab. We wanted to leave enough time to get people to ha answer, ask and answer questions, and have any discussion about these two projects and how this could be modified or adapted in different states for different audience audiences. So we do have a couple questions here. Uh, Kathy, there was, that I'm going to read of the chat box. Um, and then we can open it up to the public, and, 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 and um, we invite you to unmute yourself and ask questions or put them through the chat box. So one of the questions, Kathy, was about CLE. And it's in the chat box, and it says, is the content available for CLE credit um, in the classroom? In the classroom, um, I guess that would de that would depend on the organization that's putting it there and the way they do their CLE credits. Um, I mean, if they're a TIG-funded program, they need to be aware of the um, LSC requirements. So um, I can't I can't really give you an answer specifically on that. Um, I see there's also a question about whether or not there's a cost, and there is no cost to to do this, we just want people to get together and um, collaborate, and we're hoping to make it as easy as possible. Um, okay, let's open it up to the to the public, to, to to our audience that is with us, and see if anybody has any questions either for Tally or for Kathy. I just had a question. This is Leah Margulies from New York um, on the uh, Learn the Law site. Um, I I missed how it interacts with the interactive forms. 
Um, you can uh, you can link out to them or embed them in into can, okay. the classrooms um, along with any other pretty much any other kind of content. Yeah, because um, I think it would be useful, uh, especially where we have you know a number of forms uh, covering the same uh, or relatively the same area of law, mm -hmm. like family law, for example, all the modification petitions and things like that, they could be grouped together. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, then it would be easier for other states to find what you have. And some of that's going to be in your naming and your story uh -huh. within the site. So that's very doable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in LHI we do have a folder for shared forms. We call it the all, all state forms. So anyone that has developer access to the LHI portal can find the forms there and take a look and see if they think they are relevant to their state. And if so, they could insert them here. Um, so I think that that's a really good um, thing to, to, to talk about. And Kathy, you and I can talk a little bit more about that if, if it's of interest as part of a shared resource. Okay. Um, for the people that, that use this platform. This is Liz. I just had a question for Tally. I, I know, Tally, you all have really been uh, looking closely at your analytics as you rolled out the site and all of the outreach surrounding it. And I was wondering if there's anything you've seen in that that's um, really stood out about what which of the self-advocacy resources are most popular, or um, something about that usage that's maybe surprised you? So um, I guess there's two parts of the analytics. One of the, the first thing we learned is that it really helps to get a consultant on the analytics, uh, and uh, on the Google AdWords to go along with the analytics, because um, we did the Google AdWords and didn't bring in very many people, and now we've brought in a ton of um, folks more recently, and it's been um, the, actually the, the resources, the self-help resources that have been the, the primary thing. But what we have not done yet, and what I'm really looking for, and wish we were doing this in two months so I could give you a, a result on that, is we haven't really promoted the assessment tool yet, and that's my favorite piece of the, the website. So we don't have a lot of feedback yet. We will in a couple months uh, on that, but that's going to be one of the primary ways we're going to use um, the Google AdWords and um, also some ads on, on Facebook and, and using our Facebook platform is to really draw people into the assessment um, now that we feel really, really good about um, that every, all the kinks are worked out on that. But we don't have that information yet. And Tali, from a system advocacy perspective, um, do you have any goals or metrics, like let's say five years from now that you said the site has been up a year and a half? Are there things, high water marks that you think could be reached either in Georgia or with all of the other states um, that, that you know, you're sharing materials on as, in terms of having a national impact? Um, that, that's in, a fantastic question. Area. Yes. Um, the, um, we're at a sort of a cr critical point with Olmstead. Um, we're at, in some ways, a real high water mark in the sense that the U.S. Justice Department has made Olmstead a, a, a critical um, part of what it's doing through its Civil Rights Division, and they have litigation in most of the states. But it is a legal services case, and legal services attorneys don't do a lot of Olmstead cases. So for me, um, it is really um, making sure that self-advocates know about it enough so that um, people people with disabilities that they're interacting with um, are taking advantage of Olmstead um, through our self-help tools, but also that they're reaching out not only to the protection advocacy organizations, but to the legal services organizations, and that those organizations are equipped with the pleadings and the tools that we have on the website and the legal outline to actually take these cases on, because it's, it's just a tremendous amount of unmet need. And, and one of the things that legal services attorneys sometimes don't think about is because there's protection advocacy organizations that they would take those cases. But the reality is that these clients are real traditional legal services clients. They're kids who are in special education who are aging out of schools. They're the elderly, 
population, the senior citizens that we already represent. And um, a lot of times they're the, the people we're working with on um, wills and um, end of life planning, and then uh, just the general people with disabilities and mental illness that come through our doors every day. And so for me, um, from a systemic point of view, um, it would be huge if every legal services organization was doing an Olmstead case, which is easily possible because there's that much work that mm -hmm. needs to be done. So for the people that have the ability to write a subcode to the NIMSI disability problem code, maybe to start tracking how many Olmstead cases they're looking at. That'd be that would fantastic. be a really that would be really great if everybody added, you know, a two number extension so that then people that are working together on, on um national That'd be great. could see that would, I mean that that's the kind of thing that could be done with very little effort. I had another question for you on this. Um you know there 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 are Supreme Court decisions that are brought by legal aid that eventually have deep impact in American society. And for example, one of them for all of you who practice public benefits is Goldberg v. Kelly that basically created the due process that is now required across multiple federal departments when you're denying benefits, changing them or reducing them. Another case was brought, that was brought by Contra Costa Legal Aid that is now Bay Area Legal Aid in the 70s. Another case, for example, is the Sibley case, which was brought by Community Legal Services of Philadelphia and I think it came out in 92 that, that dealt with Social Security and the way children and working adults are assessed for qualifications and disability. That decision has also impacted the whole federal structure of Social Security and the impacts of hundreds of thousands of people. Did you look at some of those decisions to kind of think through how you wanted to create a website um, to lead to, you know, um, did this to get this Supreme Court decision that also is changing, hopefully hundreds of thousands of lives? Or do you have suggestions for people who are going, I, you know, some people are already in federal courts of appeal, and, and, and they, that decision itself may impact, you know, the region, or it may go up to the Supreme Court. Do you have recommendations for programs that are, right. that are going to be doing that with technology? Yeah. And this is a model, maybe. It, so it wasn't a, a legal services case, but Brown v. Board of Education has always been sort of our um, our guide star um, in terms of um, our advocacy, but also our um, what we thought about with this website. Um, and obviously, the, the difference is that people knew about Brown. There was a lot of anger about Brown by half the country, um, and that's why they knew about it. And then there was a lot of excitement and desire for change on the other half of the country. But the, um, so there's a difference there, but it, it's having the same sort of desegregation and integration impact. And so for us, it's, it, it's critical for, for, the, for people to get a, um, their, to understand about it. But for us, um, the, the real sort of lesson was um, what's happening here in Georgia and the fact that the Justice Department has brought litigation, and, but what didn't happen for the 15 years prior to the Justice mm -hmm. Department coming here was essentially that we had this wonderful Supreme Court decision and we had all the people in the institution still. And so how do you actually make that change? And we've started to do it. We've got a lot of lessons learned. We have things that have been successful, things that have been a disaster. And we felt like it was important to get um, the word about what, what's happening, not only here, but around the country in all sorts of different ways. And so that was really sort of the, the impetus for the website. And then the great thing about having something that has an anniversary is there's ways mm -hmm. to promote and celebrate it and, and get the word out. And that's been a huge tool for us. Yeah, in the language advocacy realm, we created a DOJ complaint form also using LHI, you know, oh, to get people. Yeah, and, and that was um, a well-received tool. So let me ask a question of Kathy. I mean, you know, these two projects are really neat because there are integrations. They're taking technology that's mature and integrating it with other technology and really bringing a group, of, a, a group together that is passionate and knows kind of what they're doing to kind of provide a new way of providing information. So in, in working through your classroom, Kathy, were there things that were a lot harder than you thought? 
Like, I don't know if creating the checklist, for example, what was the process? Was it, did, was it easy to come up with the checklist for, let's say, the pro bono lawyers? Um, how long uh, did that take? Um, building, building the class originally um, was, you know, it took time. We were very lucky to be working with um, Scott Friday and Kate Frank, our web content manager, um, who are both um, very knowledgeable. And we sort of talked it out and worked it through together. Um, probably the hardest part really um, was getting the content together. Um, we, it was much harder than we thought it would be, um, even though we had factored in the notion that, OK, this is substantive content. You need to um, work with busy attorneys and get, it, get them to fit it into their schedule. Um, but actually, building the classrooms themselves were, was not a difficult task. Um, so yeah, the hardest part was sort of hurting, hurting the content together, um, and you know that's been consistent all the way along. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that's no surprise to anybody who does this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, now that it's been built in sort of a modular format, it's going to be a whole lot easier to maintain it. So it was a worthwhile investment of our time. Um, and um, at this point, since we're moving into the national model in the project with Cali, um, there are some of the subtleties to, um, again, I think I had talked a bit about this, some of the subtleties to having um, multiple sites using the same space and using the same content and how many copies of things exist and you know who owns what and how does it get edited and you know so those are those are yeah, questions that that we've been um, working through and um, we're feeling as though we're getting a good handle on them so we'll see as it evolves but mm -hmm. those are those are the two areas where um, you know we had the most it took the most time okay thank you well I see that we are past the hour so I just wanted to thank the audience that stayed with us through the conversation. Ryan has shared Ryan has shared a lot of the links and resources in the chat, um, and hopefully people will go and access those. I want to thank both of you for sharing your projects. I think they push the they push our line a little further, and um, by giving us a, something that now we can visualize and model after. I think you ignite our imagination, but also you have reduced the level of complexity. And hopefully these tools will be tools that other states will want to replicate. And, that, and hopefully we will continue to see increased integration um, of mature tools with new ways of displaying and then working, creating very specific projects with very specific goals that are very user-centric. So thank, thank you all, and thank you. Brian and Les um, and everybody else um, that helped with the call, yeah. the setup, and everything. And I don't know, I leave it to you uh, for closing words, Brian. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia, for putting this on. Uh, very informative. Um, Pro BonoNet is putting on another webinar next Wednesday on process mapping for civil services. Uh, so please join us for that. There's also a link. Um, in the comment or um, in the chat to a survey. Um, this is a new topic for us. Um, both of these projects are new. Uh, any feedback on the presentation today is greatly appreciated. Thank you guys all for coming out.